Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Today's episode is yet another one in the series of personal stories. So I have another guest who's willing to come on the air and share with you his journey around actually all kinds of stuff, not just sex. So DJ has experience with process addiction, sex addiction, alcohol abuse, and past sexual trauma that he didn't recognize at the time, and really a history of codependent relationships and caretaking behavior. And so he's on the show today to talk about his growing awareness that he had some issues. In certain ways, he knew there was trouble all along, but really thought he could leave it behind him. He didn't realize it was stuff he had to totally take apart within himself to heal. And He's been actively involved, I think he said for six years now, in therapy and in recovery programs and a lot of inner work to totally transform his life. And he's sitting in a very nice position now in his life, happy, happily married, adopting a child, thriving business, everything's going really well, but he nearly died in this experience. So DJ is here to share a story and I hope it has an impact on you and you find it meaningful. So, DJ, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and I I know I say this with every episode that's a personal story, but I mean it sincerely. It it feels like a real honor that people will come on and and talk about their own personal journey. You know, it means a lot to me. So, and I I really think it means a lot to the listening audience, too. So, I appreciate that. Well, you're welcome. I, I hope that my story can help others. I hope so, too. So, so where does your story start? Wow, that's a that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where where would you like to start with your story? <laughs> well, you know, I can tell a little bit about myself uh, first. Uh, I I'm a therapist in Seattle, mm-hmm. and I work with individuals uh, who are addressing sexual addiction and codependency and other process addictions. And it's my specialty because all those things apply to me. Okay. I grew up in uh, Georgia. And I moved to Seattle uh, almost nine years ago. I can't believe it's been that long. And I left Georgia because I thought I was going to leave all my problems behind me. And that's oh. just not the case. <laughs> not not how it works, unfortunately. Nope. Wherever you go, there you are. Yeah. And so it wasn't until I got to Seattle that I started really having awareness that I had issues around sex or issues around addiction and relationship problems. And so I have spent the last really eight years looking at my history and getting more information. Okay. So what what were you experiencing in Georgia? Like what were the problems that you thought were sort of, I guess, circumstantial that you could leave? Well, you know, I was married at the time and my my then husband and I we didn't have a huge support network. My family was kind of hands off. Uh, when you talk about being gay in the South, you don't get a lot of support. And his family was non-existent, really. Um, okay. His uh, parents had passed and, you know, he didn't have a huge network of support, like friends and such. So we were like, we got to get out of here because we knew that, one, at the time we couldn't get legally married. So we were like, well, let's move somewhere else. Let's move somewhere where we're going to be accepted. So we're going to go to Seattle. And we were both in the same field. So we're going to come out here. And so we thought we would just have a new experience. I wanted to get away from my own caretaking behaviors of my relatives. I always say this, but I was born to be a caregiver. Uh And so I always found myself taking care of other people. And I was just done with it. I was exhausted. And I thought 3,000 miles away from family would be great. Okay. (laughs) But, you know, um, like I said, I brought all of my internal stuff with me and our relationship, my husband and I, um, 
it was dysfunctional from day one. And it was dysfunctional because that's what I had always known in relationships. I went and essentially picked the same person that my mom had married. Huh. Uh, okay. And I told her that once and she said, you know, I, I apologize for that. I was like, well, hell, I don't think you understood that you were in a dysfunctional marriage either. When did you first start to think your relationship was dysfunctional? Because you say now it was from day one, but did you realize that at the time? You know, at the time when I saw something was dysfunctional, it meant that I could, I had to fix it. Ah. So that was my MO. Like, I have to fix it. So I saw it was dysfunctional from day one. Okay. Day one. And I was like, oh, I got this. I know how to handle this. And I started essentially cleaning house. And I look back now and I'm like, oh my God, I was like running this man's life. And he just kind (laughs) of let me because I think he too, he needed some direction, some guidance. He was newly out. He was an older gentleman. And so he was kind of just finding himself. But while he was finding himself, I was wanting more of a, like the commitment and things that maybe weren't on his radar. And so there's a lot of tension early on. And I was essentially like, look, this is what I want. I want to get married. I want to have family. I want to have kids. Are you on board? And he said, yes. But the truth was he wasn't ready. He wasn't available for it. Hmm. Okay. So what other kinds of, you know, problems or concerns did you have back there, you know, even if you weren't aware of them as problems at the time? Oh, lots of arguing, lots of arguing, poor boundaries. He was into porn and, you know, it was so aggravating to me because we would be sitting on the couch and he'd be like looking at porn. I'm like, what are you doing? This doesn't work for me. Like right while you're sitting next to him on the couch, yeah, he's, absolutely. You know, like, like somebody reads a, an article on their iPad. He's just watching porn right there just, with you. He's watching the. Uh, he's actually like looking at pictures and saving them, and he had a hard drive full of porn. And he, you know, you're probably not going to believe this, but he printed out some of the pictures. And I came home from work one day, and they were in frames. Wow. And I was like, I, where am I? This is like, I, I felt like I was in the twilight zone. I was like, who does this? Yeah. But for someone who is newly out, had been in a closeted relationship and a, a marriage, uh, he was expressing himself in the way that he thought best. It just didn't work for me. And instead yeah. of me saying, this doesn't work for me, I'm out. I was like, this doesn't work for me. Let me change you. And that's <laughs> where all my codependency stuff was at work. But that's what I had always known. It's like, you got to fix people. Yeah. I see a lot of couples in my practice, of course, right? And sometimes somebody's looking at porn or doing that kind of thing, like instead of having sex with their partner, you know, sometimes it's just sort of extra, but Mm -hmm. was this having an impact on your own sex life together? Well, not so much. Okay. Um, You know, I think that the problem was that it was just affecting and my my insecurities and my self esteem, and so I really wasn't wanting to be available for sex. I'm like, mm. well, you got all the sex you need on that hard drive, right? yeah. And I was jealous, and I didn't want him to see friends because I was fearful that those people he was going out and hanging out with, he would all be having sex with. And that was mm. just my fear. Uh, yeah. I remember he had. A a friend who's a porn star, a gay porn star. And he had this man's picture in a frame hanging over the bed. And I said, that's not going to work for me. Yeah. But then he would go out with this guy and I would be like terrified. Wow. Like, I wasn't good enough. Yeah. yeah I mean, a lot stuff. of, you know, I, I know that people struggle with this in their relationships. If their partner's looking at porn or, you know, whatever, has a t- sort of a crush, but to actually know the person and think, oh, they're meeting for a drink somewhere. And oh, that's right. not what most, <laughs> most people don't have that kind of access. Right. Right. Wow. Exactly. They just don't. And so before we moved to Seattle, I found myself drowning my sorrows in alcohol and porn myself. 
Um, it was some, it was like when he was off at work, I'd be at home looking at pornography and he worked, um, as a fireman paramedic. And so he'd be gone for 24 hours plus. And so that's what I would do with my time because I just felt like crap. Now, had you been, um, so, consuming porn before that too, or was this something, be- well, because he's doing it, I'm going to pick up the, the habit. Um, you know, before I was in a relationship with him yes but my thing was when i got into relationships i was all about the person i wasn't yeah. going to be doing any outside curricular activity but when he was like gone and was distant and you know he was already doing it so i was like well this is what i should do and he had no idea hmm. all right so this is all some of the stuff you're leaving behind you think when you're leaving georgia <laughs> right i thought i was leaving it behind but let me tell you we got to Seattle and we split up two weeks later. Oh, <gasps> you're kidding. I'm not kidding. At that point, we had been together for like three and a half years. We had just moved to Seattle. We had no jobs and we split up. And so there I was still living with my ex in a one bedroom apartment in Seattle with no job. And I was like, what am I going to do with myself? And I worked really hard to find a different scenario, right? I finally got a job. I had some money. So I moved out. But then I, I found myself in a new relationship doing the exact, exact same thing. Uh, did you recognize that right away? No, I thought it was completely different. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry to laugh. <laughs> it's funny. You know, I look back at it. Well, it's just because it's also common, right? We think, oh, this is totally different. And then we recreate the same patterns because oh, it's yeah. in us. You know, we're making it happen. And that's what I try to tell people. It's like, it's within you, right? Yeah. I hear people say, oh, you're codependent with that person. I said, nope, you're just a person who's codependent. You take yeah. it wherever you go. Yeah. And that's what I did. In fact, I thought this new person was a savior, right? He said to me, I believe in you. I want to help you be successful. And these are the things that I can do for you. And I said, oh, my word, somebody's taking care of me finally. Hmm. You know, so I thought it was a different scenario, but it was. Did you end the relationship? Or, or did he want, you know, newly in Seattle? Like, how did the. Oh, I ended it on my birthday. Oh. I was like, I'm not going into another year in a relationship with you. Mm. I can't do it anymore. We were arguing about everything. Yeah. You know, my favorite music would come on on the uh, in the car. My favorite uh, artist or somebody would come on on the iPod and then be on shuffle. And he would think I did it intentionally. He would be arguing about it. And I'm like, yeah. how in the hell did I do this? It's on shuffle and blah, blah, blah. And it was just explosive. Wow. And I was just like, I can't be with you anymore. And so, you know, at that moment, you know, we ended the relationship and then I gradually moved out mm-hmm. after I got a job. And um, like I said, I just picked up with the, the next person who said, I want to be in a relationship. Of course, before that, there was some, some you know, in a, I say now inappropriate, but uh, some sexual relationships with people who were not great for me. Okay. And... And that's not, I didn't feel comfortable doing that. So for me, I always wanted to be in a relationship, not just hooking up. And yeah. so I finished up that hooking up phase and got immediately into another relationship. So, you know, you, you and I, I think, differ on the use of sex addiction as a term. Mm-hmm. But I think we agree on sort of the concept. But, you know, speak to your experience, because you said you're working with sex addiction now because you've been through this. Where where did that show up in your story? Oh, wow. So it mostly started to show up after I got married again. And my husband, I got married here in Seattle. And at that okay. point, it was legal because Seattle had different uh, laws on right. books. And so we decided... We were curious about open relationships. I had never heard of such a thing back in Georgia, but <laughs> right. here in Seattle, here is like the hot thing. Right? It's the hot thing, and I was like, "What is this about?" I was like, "I was going to." I went into research mode. I was talking to people. I was reading books, and I was like, "This is curious. I don't know if I could do this." And then one night after we got married, we just decided to try it, and it was like smoking heroin. 
Wow. I couldn't stop. Didn't want to stop. Life completely took me. I, I was ta- I'm completely taken off my course. Nothing was more important than getting that that fix. Now, Stop. is this? I, I mean, I, maybe this doesn't even matter. I was going to ask: Was this exploration the two of you were doing together, like that kind of open, or was this like you guys were off having your own that, individual sexual experience? It started that way, and let me tell you, we had a, this document of rules, and they changed daily. Uh, looser, it's, looser, and looser. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. And it's so crazy now thinking about it because I, here I was helping other people in their relationships and mine were a hot mess. Yeah. You know, and so those those rules got looser and looser. And eventually, like, I would come home from work and he would have somebody at the house. Hmm. Or I was at one of the, the sex clubs in, in Seattle uh, and- by myself. And so he's enjoying this as well, as well, right? This is oh, yeah. this is becoming super important to both of you. Oh yeah, it was the like most important thing wow. in our relationship. Yeah, and uh, it was detrimental. I mean, I look back now and I don't understand how it was. I even had a career. How really? was I even got up out of bed? I mean, there were times in the middle of the night I would leave my home to go have sex with people I didn't even know. Wow. I could have been killed. Yeah. I could have caught something. Talk about risky behavior. Risky behavior. And it was, it was really bad, Jessa. Um, I, you know, you and I met many years ago and I was just beside myself. And of course that wasn't evident to a lot of people. Not at all. Not at all. You know, I grew up knowing how to look like I have my shit together. Hi, it's Jessa. We're just going to take a quick pause here, or a little breather in the middle of the show. Thanks for listening so far. I'm wondering if you have a question that you want me to answer on a future episode. You can actually record a question for me at our website, bettersexpodcast.com. You're going to find the recorder on the footer of every page and on the side of the episode posts. And if I choose your question, I'll play it on the air and answer it as part of the show. I'd love to hear from you. So how did this phase, because you said when you were single and having this sort of hooking up phase, it didn't have that same power over you, right? Like you didn't find that so compelling that that's all you wanted to do. But but then you get into the stage in your marriage where it did. Like, how how do you see that difference? I think I was in a lot of pain in that marriage. I had entered into another relationship with another person who didn't want what I wanted. And I didn't know what my boundaries were around that like he didn't really want kids um he didn't really want to be married uh he had also gotten out of a a relationship with a woman and so i I essentially the same people and i was so hurt when you know i made these commitments with this person and then it started to dawn on me that oh my god i'm doing the same thing over and over again i was just so in pain and Mm. There are other things, you know, he, he was an alcoholic and he was a uh, verbally abusive, uh, mentally abusive. Wow. And so I wanted to escape and then I would meet other people who would treat me better than I was being treated at home. And so I never wanted to go home. Yeah. And so I would look for my safety and other people's bed and okay. that felt better to me. And were you still drinking through this phase too? I was. You know, I was never really that big of a drinker when I moved to Seattle. And now, you know, a lot of my friends from Georgia, they's like, I didn't know you had a problem with alcohol. I was like, well, when I was in Georgia, I got drunk twice and that was it. Wow. But when I got to Seattle and I got into this second relationship, he drank every day. And I remember questioning him, like, is this okay? He's like, yeah, he can drink every day and it not be a problem. And I was like, really? Because I grew up in a home with an alcoholic, so I don't really know any different. Yeah. And then I remember he would make calls. He would send me messages. Hey, stop by Costco and get some wine. And I'd go to Costco and get a a bottle. And he's like, "Um, how about you get a couple bottles next time (laughs) to last a week? And then I would bring them home and they wouldn't last two days. 
Wow. You know, and so he would be passed out drunk and I would just finish off the bottle. You know, and and then I started getting my own alcohol and drowning my sorrows. And then everything really fell apart when he was angry with me because I hooked up with someone before a party we were going to attend. And he got there before I did because I was busy. And when I got there, he had brought his own bottle of wine. He drank his whole his whole bottle of wine and was at my friend's, a colleague's house, drunk. And I was like, you know what? I think we need to go because we had brought separate cars. And I said, but you're not, you're, you can't drive home. So I went to take his keys from him and he grabbed me and put me in a headlock on the front lawn of my colleague's house. Yikes. And it was just scary. And I took the keys, got him in the car. And, you know, from, I'd say for about half an hour from that drive um, from my friend's house to our house, he physically assaulted me. Wow. While I was driving and I was paralyzed. I didn't know what to do. And then I, we got home and I got him in the house the next day. He didn't know what happened. And I was like, I got to get out of here or you're going to treatment. And he was like, I'll try out treatment. And so when he tried out treatment and got involved in the intensive outpatient, that's when I found out that I had a problem too. Um, I was no longer fixing him because somebody else was doing it. The professionals were doing it. And I had no job. Hmm. And I spiraled out of control. Absolutely. So what does that mean? Like, what what does that look like? (sighs) Drinking and driving. Oh, gosh. So drinking and driving, uh, hooking up with even more strangers, um, you know, staying overnight with people because I couldn't drive home. Wow. uh, Showing up to work late. Um, You know, barely making it to appointments. Um, and at that time, I had a private practice, and I was working at a community of agents. And so, people were concerned. They yeah. Were like, oh, you need to go to Al-Anon. And I said, I'm going to go to Al-Anon. Um, I went to Al-Anon, and I was like, oh, God, I'm going to stop drinking because he's not drinking, and I don't need to be drinking. So, I stopped drinking, and then I went to Codependence Anonymous, and that's where I learned. I really learned all of the things. I remember going through their self-assessment. And I highlighted every single thing. Wow. You know, and then I got into uh, Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous the very next, about three months later. So I started working both programs. And then I took the self-assessment in Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. And it's a 40 question. I said yes to 38 of them. Hmm. And it was just heartbreaking because it was staring me right in the face now. I had it in black and white. Yeah, yeah. So, um, the paper didn't lie. And I was like, who has been following me my whole life documenting my crazy? Yeah, how do, how do they make a test <laughs> just for me, right? Uh, right. <laughs> and, you know, by doing the work in recovery, um, it was revealed to me uh, that I have been molested when I was 16. And I didn't think that what had happened to me was uh, a molestation. But oh. it, was sit- it was sitting in the room of a recovery meeting that I realized that a 45-year-old doesn't have a relationship with a 16-year-old. Oh, wow. And yeah. it'd be appropriate. So you had not had that context before to, I to understand. Not. Yeah. I had not. And it started just opening up everything. Wow. And that's when the recovery work really took off because I was finally able to see that here's some root problems right here. You know, where were my caregivers? You know, why hadn't they stopped it? Yeah. Uh, Why is this man under a jail somewhere? Right. Um, And so that I started cluing my family into all everything, my recovery, the molestation, everything. And were they supportive because they were there, not seemingly protecting you? I mean, maybe they didn't know, but... It was hard. I because my mom, like, she said, she's like, I, I thought something had happened to you. 
And my therapist was like, she knew something that happened to you and did nothing. Right, right. It's so hard to see that too. Right. It's, it's so important to see it though. Mm-hmm. And so she was really distraught about it. She wanted to know what was going to happen to the man who had done this. My dad, it was his best friend. Oh, gosh. And I didn't grow up with my dad, but I knew this man my entire childhood. Um, he had lived across the street from my great-grandmother. And so he he had approached me when I was 16 one summer and, you know, uh, groomed me for, for a sexual relationship. Yeah. You know, and my great grandmother at the time knew that something wasn't right and she wanted me to stop talking to him. But I was adamant that I would not stop talking to him because uh, he was an adult who was paying attention. Right, right. I mean, it's, it stuff feels good, right? I mean, yeah. emotionally, physically, potentially, it just, yeah. And nothing had happened at that point when she had confronted me. But I wish more had been done. Yeah. And it sort of speaks to how far, I guess, our minds will go to make things okay, right? To like not recognize sort of what's right in front of our face. It's a problem, Mm -hmm. you know, but to sort of make it a a normal or this is fine. There's nothing nothing to see here, (laughs) you know. So imagine doing all of this and uh, and uncovering all of this trauma and working on the trauma. I mean, I was engaged in two different recovery programs, had a sponsor, went to therapy every week, sometimes twice a week. And my husband decided that recovery wasn't for him. Mm. He got done with the program and was done with recovery. Um, I didn't know at the time, but he had started compulsively gambling and paying out the retirement account. (gasps) Um, and he also had not, when I got into recovery, we stopped the open relationship, but he didn't really understand why it was I was so invested in this, uh, recovery. And I was like, I almost died because I I think there was a part of the story that I I left out was that I started having unprotected sex because I just gave up. Oh, wow. That's what got me into seeing my current therapist that I've been seeing for the last six years. I just didn't care. I wanted to die. Wow. And so I told him, I told my husband, I was like, this is important to me. He was jealous of like my sponsor and my sponsees. Yeah. It was crazy. So he continued to spiral out while I was getting well. And I started mm-hmm. setting some really important boundaries and firm boundaries. And he was drinking and hiding it. He was gambling it uh, away his retirement, our retirement. And yeah. also having, uh, still engaging in sexual relationships with others. Yeah. And I was, I was getting well and he wasn't. And it just all exploded. Right. So obviously you've been in therapy, you've been in these recovery programs, you've been processing some of the stuff that happened to you a long time ago. Like anything else you want to add to how you have overcome these challenges? Absolutely. You know, I grew up uh, in a family that identifies as Southern Baptists. And when I was a kid, they used to try to make us go to church. and I hated it. And I think I hated it because the messages that I was hearing was that I was not accepted because I was gay. Mm. And so I resisted it and to the point where I just decided to stop going. And so I always believed that I couldn't turn to God for help. But in the rooms of recovery, I came to understand that I didn't have to believe in someone else's definition of God or higher power, that I could have my own. And so it opened me up to a new relationship with spirituality. And I really believe that my my spiritual relationship with the higher power, and I do call that higher power God, Mm -hmm. uh, saved me. And... I got my shit together. (laughs) You know, I got into the rooms of recovery six years ago. I have not had a drink and I have not acted out in compulsive sexual behavior since the day I walked in those rooms. Wow. Well, and not only that, I happen to know that your story has a very happy ending. I mean, not that it's over, oh, but you know, it does. <laughs> yeah, my but story if, if is the ending great. were now, right. It's like, tell us, tell us how this has worked out for you. Well, I'm a uh, yeah, best-selling author. Uh, I just wanted love, recovered a codependent sex and love addict. 
And I know very well that it's helped people all over the world find recovery and uh, stay in recovery. People send me messages all the time. I really love that. Um, I have a thriving practice where I primarily focus on sex addiction recovery and codependency recovery. I was married uh, for the third time on July 15th. Yeah. And I never thought I would get married again. And I was scared. Yeah. But I have the most amazing husband. And, you know, he's perfectly imperfect. And so am I. And he accepts me. And I'm not trying to change him. He's not trying to change me. Yeah. And we have a beautiful son who is two. Uh, we are foster parents, but pretty soon we'll get to adopt him. Yeah. And life is great. I have like five sponsees. I have two sponsors. I go to meetings every week. Um, I have sanity. Even though my life is very, very full. Right. I still feel sane. Yeah. And yeah. that's, it's a miracle. And I even uh, joined another 12-step recovery program to address my lack of understanding about money because uh. I got no information about money growing up. And either we didn't have any or I had someone who was manipulating, controlling the money that we did have. So I had to get them awareness about my part. Right, right. Well, you have been busy to to great effect i mean it's just you know it's wonderful i mean we did meet probably six years ago seven yeah. years ago i'm not quite sure you know i'm not sure if you were in the midst of that or if you were just newly out but certainly i uh, you know, we just met professionally I, right. I had no no inkling of any of this but mm -hmm. uh, yeah and so now every everybody knows i i'm in recovery there's no secret even right. my per, you know personal uh facebook i talk about recovery because it's what saved my life yeah um, yeah, and you want to get the so, word out for people, right? If people, if people are private about this, then then it it doesn't reach the people that need to hear it. I know. And so any opportunity I have to talk about my journey, I am on it. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And I hope, you know, I, I really hope it makes a difference for somebody listening today. I hope so, too. And if anyone uh, is open to sharing with you or with me about how this uh, episode has been helpful for them, for them, please let us know because that just helps us keep doing the, the great work that we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, I said this before we started the recording that a lot of times my personal stories are anonymous and, and you did not want that. So do you want to say a word about how, I mean, you mentioned the book, but do you want to say anything about a website or anything about how people might get in touch with you directly yeah, if they want to? Absolutely. DJBurr.com. That's D-J-B-U-R-R.com. You can find me there, my books. You can find information about my practice. I'm very open about my recovery journey. It's, uh, it's one of the things that keeps me alive. So uh, if you have any questions or concerns or anything uh, related to recovery or addiction, feel free to send me a message. Uh, there's a variety of ways to contact me, and you can find them all on my website, djbird.com. Great. Oh, and before I forget, do mention your podcasts, too, because oh, yeah. even though you may not keep those going, I know you, we were just talking about that, those past episodes are still out there in the world, right? So oh, what are those? they are. So um, there's Making an Addict, and that is available on iTunes, Google Play. Um, you can find that at makingaddict.com. And then also Journey On, Survivors, Even from Sexual Abuse and Assault. Um, and that is at journeyonpod.com. And you can get all the past episodes and you can hear my story again if you want. And those podcasts are just amazing. I mean, like so many downloads in so many different countries. And I'm just grateful that people are able to, to hear about addiction and recovery. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And I really appreciate your time today. Yes. Thank you. You've been listening to Better Sex. Please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. And that's a wrap for today. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, if some of this material resonates with you and you would like to make a difference and make sure that this keeps coming out in the world once a week, ongoing, 
there are a couple things you could do to show your appreciation. The first would be to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. That really helps us be found by new listeners when you review the show on iTunes. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash iTunes. The other thing I want to invite you to consider is becoming a Patreon. For a small monthly pledge, you get some benefits. So for $2 a month, you get advance access to every single episode. For $5 a month, you get a chapter of my upcoming new book. And for $10 a month, I host quarterly get to know you and question and answer chats over the web. And you get invited to that. I would love to have your membership in that become part of the Better Sex family. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash Patreon, which is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Again, thanks for listening. I'm glad you're here. Feel free to comment, ask questions, get in touch. I'd love to hear from listeners. Thanks. Thanks.